Ladies and gentlemen, please give a 60 Days of Summer welcome to Mr. Drew Gooden. Welcome in, my friend. Thanks for having me. Thanks. I love the energy here. Wow. Right, you can feel it. I can feel it. I can see it. Welcome to Springfield. Glad to be here. This Glad is your first time, you were saying. This is my first time in Springfield, and let alone uh, the Hall of Fame. It's, what do you, I mean, can I get some first impressions as you, as you soak is, it all this in? This is amazing. I mean, I, first of all, I wish I could go back to 1989 when I was eight years old and <laughs> experience this, this as a kid. Yeah. But, uh, you know, coming back at this age and actually uh, coming through up the ranks of the world of basketball to see this, this is amazing. I'm thrilled that you're here. I want to go all the way back to the beginning for you. The late 80s, early 90s in Oakland, California, the Bay Area. Now, I know that for the guards growing up in your area, they had guys, I mean, the legends of Gary Payton and Jason Kidd were still fresh in everyone's mind. But for a guy your size, growing up, and I've seen your handles, <laughs> you've got some Gary Payton, Jason Kidd in you. I mean, my, my other name is Tragic Johnson. Tra <laughs> Tragic Johnson. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard of that one, but uh, I guess you said I got a little bit of handle. <laughs> so where, do, where does a guy like you uh, find your inspiration coming up um, at El Cerrito? And, and what was that like growing up in Oakland being a basketball nut? Well, first and foremost, my father played uh, professional basketball overseas in a country by the name of Finland. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the country of Finland. It's a Scandinavian country. And uh, he played a couple years there, met my mom, came back to Oakland, California. I was born. And uh, basketball was kind of part of me my whole life, you know. And my dad was always the guy uh, pushing basketball. If not pushing basketball, we were watching basketball on TV. If we weren't watching basketball on TV, I was watching him play in rec leagues or, uh, you know, playgrounds right up the street. So I always grew up around the game of basketball. Could he still ball? He can still play basketball at the age of 67. Nice. And uh, he gives me a run for my money sometimes, but, uh, you know, then I got to put it on him. Does he got that old man game? He tries to stick, <laughs> tries to get, get low. He has old man by far <laughs> game. He's like a 6'3 a, a DeMarcus Cousins, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that image. <laughs> a little scary, right? It's a little scary. Yeah. Now, your senior year um, at El Cerrito, you take your team all the way to the state championship, lose to a guy named Deshaun Stevenson, um, who also had a nice little NBA career. But by then, your recruitment was pretty much complete. You had signed, sealed, and delivered. You were going to Kansas, going to be a Jayhawk. Can you talk about your recruitment? This was before the social media days, before everything was out. We had to wait and read magazines to find out where you were going. Yeah, you had to read publications. I know uh, there was probably a couple magazines out there at the time that would rank high school players. And by far, I was never ranked on that list, ladies and gentlemen and kids. I was always a guy that had to work very hard uh, to be seen. And, uh, you know, during those days in my memory uh, of coming up in the ranks in high school, I always remember how important my grades always were to me. Uh, grades always allowed, my, my schoolwork always allowed me to A, be eligible to play basketball, and then B, when I did get recruited by colleges, I had the right proper grades uh, that made, made it a lot easier for me to sign for a scholarship than it was for some other guys or other people that didn't have the, the proper grades. So, that was the most important thing for me is to be eligible to play basketball and, 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 and going to school. And that was big, uh, a big thing for my father as well and my family. So without that, I would have never had gave myself a chance. So fast forward it now when I have Duke, North Carolina, Kansas, UCLA recruiting me, it was a, I was an easy recruit. You know, it, it, they wanted me even more. And that gave me an opportunity to really make a good decision and choose the University of Kansas. And that career and your recruiting class, you, Nick Collison, Kirk Heinrich, yeah. those three guys, you three, talk about a big three in college. <laughs> you were one of the first big threes of your era. 
Can you talk about those, those early moments, realizing that the three of you had something special? Well, we didn't know we were special because, like I said, when these publications were out at the time, we probably had a, a top 10, maybe a top 20 recruiting class with Kurt Heinrich, Nick Collison, and myself at the time. And it wasn't until halfway through our freshman year where all three of us began to start <laughs> yeah. uh, collectively as a unit as freshmen at Kansas. And that's kind of unheard of, especially under Roy Williams' watch, <laughs> <laughs> if you know Coach Roy Williams. Uh, he's now at the University of North Carolina, but at the time he was at Kansas. And once we uh, got together and started to see that, I think we all kind of pushed each other, uh, whether it was in a classroom. I mean, we, we were a real competitive group. We always wanted to make the most shots in practice. Who's going to be the first in practice? Who's going to be the last in practice? Who was going to have the highest GPA this, uh, <laughs> this semester? So we were a competitive group. And I think us being co competitive amongst each other kind of led to success for our entire basketball team. Uh, not only that year, but even down the road. I love hearing that, Drew. And, and I think for those of us who have done work with Coach Williams, uh, well, I've never played for him. This might surprise you. I didn't play at a high level. Uh, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but yeah, That's true. Thank you. Thank you. Please tell my wife you said that. Roy Williams has this disarming charm about him, but no one will compare with his fire on the court. Can you talk about, because, you know, he has that great accent. He's such a gentleman. But man, between the lines, I've seen him reduce dudes to rubble. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have some stories. <laughs> <laughs> Any you can tell us now? Yes, yes. Well, you know, like your freshman year in college, it's like any other first year, freshman year in high school, first day of kindergarten, first day of junior high school. So uh, my freshman year, this is all new to me, time management, uh, having to uh, balance books, leisure time, and basketball all in one. So I was on pins and needles already coming in, coming in as a freshman. So uh, Roy Williams has this charm about him that it, it's, it's so good mm -hmm. that I'm from California, which is a beautiful state. He got me to go to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he got me to go to Kansas. So talking about talk, uh, talking a cat off a fish wagon, yeah. you know. But um, so he has that charm, great guy about him. But, you know, until that first practice, yeah. when I threw a behind the back pass that wasn't as successful, like I said, I, <laughs> my nickname was Tragic Johnson. Tragic Johnson. I threw a behind the back pass that wasn't as successful as I, it should have been. <laughs> and Roy Williams stopped practice. Ooh. And his words was this. <laughs> he went to his pocket first. He took out the cash he had in his pocket. <laughs> And he said, you see this, son? And he threw it on the floor. He said, that can, that can buy a lot of bus tickets back to Oakland, California. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I'm sitting here while Roy Williams is making it rain on me in front of everybody, telling me that a bus, this, he could buy a lot of bus tickets for me to go back to Oakland <laughs> the next time I threw that pass. And I kind of just remember kind of whispering and thinking to myself, Hey, you flew me in here. You're gonna fly me back, you know, <laughs> type of type of type of situation. But I didn't say I didn't say anything. I just, you know, went along with it. But then that's when I knew that perfection was key, and he was really consistent, persistent with everything that yeah. he did in his teachings. And he always was a uh, advocate of attention to detail. Yeah. And that's what I learned from him. And I think that's why we saw such progress with the three of you, right? You guys went uh, freshman year, round of 32. Sophomore year, sweet 16. Junior year, final four. I'm impressed. I mean, are you, you've been studying me. Did you know all this or did you just practice this like last night? I have a gigantic head. <laughs> this is all brain and facts. This is I don't know what I ate for breakfast, yeah. but I know what you did in college. Um, and so talk to me about after your junior year, you, Kirk, and Nick were on this incredible trajectory and you led the nation in rebounding and then you make the decision to declare for the NBA draft. Um, I'm wondering what that decision was like for you and who, maybe how, how it felt as you were going into the draft. Well, this was 2002, and at the time, um, Tim Duncan was kind of like the staple of uh, a household name of a guy who completed four years of college. The NBA was always there for him after his freshman year, after his sophomore year, after his junior year. Uh, the NBA was always there for Tim Duncan. He would have been a number one pick whatever year he would have left. Mm -hmm. So it was a time and an era where the best thing to do 
was to stay in college as long as she possibly could, graduate from college, and then enter your, enter your name into the NBA draft. So it was a, a big stigma for guys to actually leave school early. And it wasn't until Kevin Garnett kind of brought that back into a, a reality where guys can actually uh, leave out of high school and have a successful NBA career uh, surpassing college, and then later on Kobe Bryant. So at this particular moment, um, just fast forward maybe six years after, the, after those, you know, Kobe Bryant and Kevin uh, Garnett being drafted out of high school, I was sitting here my junior year, actually my sophomore year the first time, and saw that I could have been a top five pick. Mm -hmm. And I had a conversation with Roy Williams at the time, uh, after season, and he told me uh, that this might not be the right time for you to enter the draft, and I think you need one more year of college, and then we could come back and revisit this uh, conversation again. So I put my trust in Roy because he's, he's a Hall of Fame coach. If you, He's somewhere on one of these pictures yep. up here. Um, so I listened to him. And not only did I listen to him, I listened to my mom, I listened to my father, and they also wanted me to go back. So I went back for my junior season and uh, had a fabulous, I mean, a, a dream season yep. uh, that year. We did everything, I did everything, but win a championship. We fell short to Maryland that year. Um, but I had that conversation with Roy then, and he told me, son, you're ready. It's time for you to get out of here. And um, that day I promised him that, you know, even though I'm leaving, I'm gonna finish my degree. I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I'm gonna finish my degree. And I promised him and my mother that uh, before I entered the draft. Uh, last year, I was a graduate finally at the University of Kansas. Hey, congratulations. So it, uh, yeah. yeah. It took me 14, it took me 15 years. It was one hell of a senior year because all 15 <laughs> years was in the NBA, so. <laughs> but uh, I got a copy of my diploma and without even telling Roy Williams, I sent it to him and uh, got it framed, everything for him, sent it to North Carolina, uh, wrote him a handwritten letter, letter which uh, you don't see too often because I, I think it's really mean, meaningful to write handwritten letters. So. Yeah. Sent him that, sent him a diploma, and he, he broke down to tears, and uh, he has it hanging now in his office uh, there in North Carolina. So I think that's the reason why I left school early, but I came back to finish. That is a gorgeous story. Coach is right there. I'm looking at him, looking down on us. Right oh, there, yeah, Right yeah, next yeah. to Hakeem. Oh, yep, the, yep, those those eyes that threw that money at me that day. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so draft night, there was only one definite in the 2002 draft, Yao Ming was going number one overall. After that, guys like you, Nene, Wilcox from that Maryland team. Yeah. Everyone, Jay Williams. And then it was just this sort of, no one knew after Yao what was gonna shake out. Again, before social media, how was draft night for you? How did you find out that it was Memphis? Was it right there in the green room? Did you have a particularly good workout for them? Well, I worked out for five teams that draft because uh, I was projected to be a top three, top five pick. So uh, I remember working out for the Memphis Grizzlies. They had the fourth pick, and Jerry West, you guys know who Jerry West is? <laughs> if, you, if you don't know how he looks, he's, a, he's the NBA logo. So, um, so I, he also drafted Kobe Bryant. So this is a guy that I had to work out in front of <clears throat> who was known for being a great draft uh, expert and seeing talent uh, at an early age and seeing potential in, in players in the draft. So I got the opportunity to work out for the Memphis Grizzlies and after my workout, Jerry West took me to dinner and he said, don't work out for no more teams. Wow. If you're available at four, if you're available at four, you're gonna be a Memphis Grizzly. <clears throat> wow. Now that I think he was telling the truth, <laughs> who, who knows, you know. <laughs> It's, it's so, I was on pins and needles and just to have the opportunity to even be talking to Jerry West was an honor for me. So uh, the first three names got called during the draft and there I was at four going to Memphis Grizzlies. So he kept his word and, uh, and, and that's how I, I got drafted at number four that year in 2002 to the Memphis Grizzlies. That is a great story. And now you get to Memphis and at that point, the Memphis Grizzlies were still a very young franchise. There was a lot of turnover at the coaching position. 
I think in the first six years, they had five coaches. And it seemed to me, as a fan, like an organization that was looking for an identity, um, looking for a rudder. What was that like for 22-year-old Drew Gooden to show up and to maybe not have the luxury that guys who went a little bit behind you or ahead of you were able to go in and plug into a space? Yao got to Houston, and he was in a place that had an identity. What was that like for you? It was tough, and I was 20 years old when I got drafted. I know the numbers might not make sense that I, I did three years of college and got drafted, and I was still 20 years old. I started college when I was 17. Did you? So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I was 20 years old, uh-huh. going to Memphis. The Grizzlies just uh, moved from Vancouver. The mm-hmm. Grizzlies started in Vancouver. So they were uh, uh, an a, a expansion team when they had the Toronto Raptors the other Canadian team with the Vancouver Grizzlies. The first year that they moved to Memphis, they drafted a guy by the name of Pal Gasol, who will be in this Hall of Fame one day. And he was the rookie of the year, the year, <clears throat> the year before I got drafted. The following year, it was the second year Memphis uh, had a team, the Grizzlies, and then that, that was my draft class. So my draft class came in, was me, Gordon Gerichek, and then they also had Shane Battier and Pau Gasol. So we were a young team at the time. Yeah. A young, very, very bad team at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I got traded after my rookie year, yeah. or actually halfway through my rookie year to Orlando. And that's when I got a chance to play with the likes of Tracy McGrady and ended up going to the playoffs uh, my first year as a rookie. So, Did that change the way, uh, the, the way you viewed the... The, the career of, of basketball playing being dealt midway through your rookie year, do you think that changed the way that you approached it? Yeah, because then, I mean, now trades are like the norm. Yeah. Uh, back then, it's kind of like a draft pick stayed with his team throughout his whole career. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it was kind of unheard of, especially being a top five pick, <clears throat> getting traded halfway through a season. Mm-hmm. So... I had to learn at a young, a, a young age the business of basketball and what it took Dwayne Wade 13, 14 years before he left Miami. Yeah. It took me four months to have to figure <laughs> out, you know. Uh, just bought a house in Memphis, uh, had a routine going, a daily routine going on. I knew my way around the city finally, and then halfway through, through the year, I get traded. And, it was just a, another learning experience for me, and I'm glad I got to learn it earlier because I got traded a year and a half later to, <laughs> to Cleveland. That's true. So I was on three teams within, it seems like, two and a half seasons. But I think that was probably where my career really started yeah. when I got a chance and opportunity to start playing with LeBron James. Now, I told you this moment was going to come, and here it is. I only have three questions left for Drew Gooden. After that, you will get a chance to ask Drew Gooden questions. So start to think about what I'm leaving out on the table. What would you like to ask? After this next question, I'll ask for volunteers. You can put your hand in the air. You'll be recognized by one of the great Who Paul staffers. Can we get Drew some, some water? Would that be possible? A Thanks so parched. much, Matt. Um, it's because I'm throwing such fastballs up here. I'm throwing heat. Uh, you talk about the trades, and you were, in a 14-year NBA career, you were traded six times. And you mentioned Cleveland, and we'll talk about that 2007 championship series, championship run, where you've lost in the finals. Um, But I really want to talk about the business of trades and how in free agency, you get a chance to pick where you're going. So for trades, you're often left, I think, probably figuring out Am I going to like it here? Was there one trade that you were just excited about when, as it happened, you get the news, you're like, oh, snap. Oh, wait, I'm going there? Was it, were there any one of those trades? Uh, yeah. Um, it, was a, it was a couple of them. I yeah. think all six of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they came at the right time? Because I always wanted to get to the next, <laughs> the yeah. next hand. You know, it's yeah, almost yeah. like playing poker. You know, they deal you a hand, and you say, you know what? I don't like this hand. Yeah. And you throw it back. But what I learned about that, that sometimes you have to play that hand. Because every hand that you, you, you might think is the winning hand, it might not be the winning hand. So there's a couple times in my career where I thought I was going to a bad team. Uh-huh. I thought it was not the right situation for me as an individual. Uh, I knew it was a business. And I kind of I kinda wanted to fix the cards. And sometimes when I look back at it, uh, the harder situations that I, st- I stuck with 
became my best situations. Yeah. Yeah, every time that I tried to fix the situation, I was back in that same situation mm -hmm. within months or within a, the following season. So I learned a lot uh, playing, uh, playing the hand that I was dealt, as a lot of people would say, so. Absolutely. You, you mentioned Cleveland is where, you, you can bring that up, Matt, if you want. Yeah, so the best trade I, I was excited about, I had an opportunity to play with a, a team and an organization was when I got traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah. yeah. Dwight Howard had got drafted to Orlando Magic where I was playing, and at the time, we all thought Dwight Howard was gonna be a power forward. I was a power forward, and I saw, I saw a problem with that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, looking back at it now and seeing the career that Dwight has had, you would think that we, me and him would have been able to coexist in Orlando at that time. But I was involved in a trade maybe a week after they drafted Dwight Howard with Anderson Virgil, uh, me, for Tony Batie, who Tony Batie ended up coming to Orlando, and me and Anderson got to go to Cleveland and play with a guy by the name of LeBron James. I've heard of him. And that was an eye-open experience for me because we always heard how good of a player and how great of a player he was at a young age, but now we actually got to see it up close and personal. And at the age of 19 years old, uh, he, he was, if not better then, than he is now. I've never seen anything like that in a, in a basketball player, yet alone a teenager. And everything that we saw during that first year is every, you know, when they, they came out with that campaign witness, I think we're all witnessing it now. But at first we were like, come on, witness, witness what? You know, everybody was saying this, but now it just came to realization that he might be arguably the best basketball player ever. Do you have questions for Drew Good? And if so, put your hands in the air right now. One of the great Hoopal staffers will come around and recognize you and put you into line to, my, to our right and your left. The 2007 championship run for your team, I remember it as, again, you and Anderson played such a key role with that LeBron fella. Is there one story from that, is there one aspect of that team, of that run, that you wish more people knew? Uh, everyone looks at the results, that was LeBron's first try, you all lost, but what, ha what about that team do you wish people knew? I think a lot of people don't come to realization that, uh, you know, basketball is real systematic. And Mike Brown, who was our head coach at the time, learned under Coach Popovich in San Antonio. So everything we ran at the entire season was all San Antonio's offense <laughs> and all San Antonio's defense. <laughs> you see where I'm getting with this? Yeah. So this whole season, we, we run all of San Antonio's plays, all of their defensive schemes, and then we get to the championship, and guess who we have to play? The San Antonio Spurs. The San Antonio Spurs. <laughs> so... My, so Manu, I'm not, I'm not using that as an excuse, but <laughs> Manu funny. Ginobili, Tony Parker, and Tim Duncan, Duncan already won championships already. This is our first go around. So we're like deer, like a deer in headlights right now. Young guys finally got to the finals and have an opportunity to play against this juggernaut in the San Antonio Spurs, which by the way, know all our plays. Yeah, as you're running them. As we're running them, all our hand signals. <laughs> You know, so it was it was a learning experience for us to see where you know where we where we got to, uh -huh. but where we needed to be. Yeah, and that that series uh, ended pretty quick. We lost four zero. Yeah, that's when LeBron got uh, you know the infamous sweeping of uh, of LeBron James and the San Antonio Spurs. But if you look back at that series, and I finally went back a couple years back and, and saw the saw the film, we weren't that far away from making that a series. Right. I just think the inexperience and um, us collectively not uh, thinking we could beat them, we kind of end up beating ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, yeah. right? And they knew our plays. <laughs> and the hand signals, I love that. I had never heard that story before. My final question, Drew, you have a couple of awesome projects happening right now that keep you in basketball. The first, as I mentioned in your introduction, is you're playing for a championship this Friday, the big three, the threes company team out of Oakland, which has to feel awesome. And the other is the TV work that you're doing um, for Comcast Sports in Washington for the Wizards. Can you talk to me about the way those two things keep the fire burning for you? Yeah, so one thing when you're 
finish playing basketball, you know, we all try to transition to something, whether it's a, a, a outside passion that we, we like, whether it's philanthropy work, uh, whether it's business, real estate. Uh, my thing was I, I love the game of basketball. I love talking about basketball. I love staying engaged with the game. So what better job was there to do than doing it on TV? or holding the mic and doing it on the radio broadcast. So doing the TV now for the Washington Wizards, I finished my last three seasons of my career with the Wizards and uh, had a good run. And now they think, you know, I'm, I'm, I, well, I am, I don't think, I know that I'm part of that, that organization now and that history of that organization. So it was a good transition for me to still be involved with the team in some capacity and being able to still talk basketball and knowing those guys that are out there playing basketball, like John Wall, Bradley Beal, uh, who else is still there, Otto Porter. Mm -hmm. So having that relationship with those guys and now not just being on the bench, but being on TV and being able to talk about the game, uh, being able to tell you what John Wall does in practice, being able to tell you uh, the countless hours that Bradley Beal spends shooting uh, every night in the gym, you know, I have that connection. And I think as an audience, you guys want to hear those stories. And I just love bridging that gap with fans and, and, and the game of basketball. And it's, I would have I did it for free, you know, and that, that lets you know that I love it. Are they going to push for the number one seed in the East this year? Uh, <laughs> I like how, <laughs> you know, I think Boston uh, <laughs> yeah. has a, a big chance. And I'm saying that not because I'm here, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really think uh, you guys, uh, Danny Ainge has done a great job, and I don't know who's going to play. I know it's going to be some mad guys on that team uh, not being able to get in the, the same amount of playing time as they did last year, but I think they're, they might be the deepest team in the NBA and for years to come with the draft picks available. But uh, the Wizards, I think they're in my top five right now. They have some work to do. They just acquired Dwight Howard. I'd like to see how that's going to fit in the equation for them uh, going forward. And then finally, the big three. It's been so much fun watching that league. In fact, we had Nate Robinson here last month. He was talking about how it's great to get out and ball once a week with the guys that he used to play with in the NBA. That league is taking off for a reason. It's a great product. It's an awesome experience. Talk to us about it from a player's perspective. What's that been like? Uh, well, last year I didn't play in this, the big three. Does anybody follow the big three in here? Yeah, see, exactly, yeah. perfect, yeah. That's good, thank you. I mean, I was a fan last year myself. I had it on my DVR, uh, watched it, the preseason all the way into the finals of last year. And it was just interesting entertainment because there's a window in summer where there's just baseball and nothing else, you know what I mean? And the football season's about to start, basketball season just ended. Uh, you know, other than the PGA Tour, I, I don't see what else is really out there, maybe the World Cup. So, I, and it's also a time for kids to still be out of school and to get to stay up late and come watch games on a Friday night till 11 at night, you know, or a Saturday till almost midnight. So I think it's a good, a good way for kids to be even uh, engaged, because it's not like a school night on a regular NBA, uh, NBA schedule. So I think that is great for families to come participate and watch. And not only that, as a player playing in it now from the outside, uh, looking in from last year, it's just a, 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 I'm in a ball of joy right now. Just 10 weeks, you, you, 10 games, you play to 50, and people get to see you, and people still want that autograph. People still want to watch you play, and it's just uh, amazing that the game, where the game of basketball is now, where you guys want to see us old farts play out there now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Drew Gooden. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Now we get to the hard questions, Drew. I was just, I was layups. These are slam dunks here. Uh, so we're going to bring on the first question. For anyone asking questions, I have two requests. One, that you allow me to hold the microphone, and the other is that you introduce yourself to Mr. Gooden before you ask. Deal? All right. Go right ahead, buddy. My name is Drew. I'm from, oh. my name is Drew. I'm from Putnam, Connecticut. And Drew, how did you make the Washington Wizards? Good. Good, good question. All right, um, I signed a 10-day contract 
uh, for the Washington Wizards. And it was the first time that I had to ever be in that situation, not signing a guaranteed contract for the whole year. So I uh, signed a 10 day contract, played Will in those 10 days, signed a second 10 day contract, played Will for those 10 days, signed for the rest of that season, and then signed a three year deal after that. So I was there almost four years. Thank you, Drew. It's a lot of hard work, right? I bet you're a hard worker too. Thank you, Drew. So, yeah, great question. Come on up, bud. How's it going today? Uh, my name is Ben. I'm from Poughkeepsie, New York. Have you played an other sport besides basketball? Yes. Now, I love basketball, but I really, really love baseball. Like, I'm a baseball player at heart, and I always wanted to uh, be a pitcher in first base, but I, when it got to like playing real baseball, I feel like I always got beat by the lefty. I always got beat by the left-handed pitcher. I always got beat by the, the left-handed glove on first base who could do the splits. Then I was like, ah, baseball not, might not be for me, so I ended up playing basketball. But baseball is my second, uh, I would say, secret occupation. Thanks, Ben. Awesome question. Well, they really teased you in Lawrence, putting the baseball diamond right near Fog Allen. Then you had to walk by it to get to work. That's a bummer. Well, you know what? I played with, anybody know who CeCe Sabathia is? Absolutely. For the Yankees? We played Little League Baseball together, and I was better than CeCe, put it that way. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Someone tell him. We're live right now. Someone tell CeCe. Hi, I'm Will. I'm from Reno, Nevada, and I'm wondering who else is on your big three squad? Um, I have Baron Davis. Anybody know who Baron Davis is? Yep, yep. yep. Baron Davis. We have uh, Keith Bogans, Damar Johnson, Dante Jones, who went to Duke and just won a championship with the Cleveland Cavaliers in 16. And uh, Demar, oh, am I, oh, Andre Emmett, yeah, wow. who went to Texas Tech, who's, so, a, who's our ringer. You feel you have a pretty good chance then, right? Uh, we hope so, but we're playing against Team Power next uh, Friday, or this Friday, who have, they have Big Baby Davis, Glenn oh, yeah. Davis. They have Corey Maggetti, Quentin Richardson, the Birdman. I mean, yeah, they're pretty deep. So we have uh, we have uh, our work cut out for us. A lot of physicality there, then. It's a lot of physicality. Well, good luck. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Andre Emmett could throw down. That man pulls play. rims, I tell you. Hi, my name is Jackson. I'm from Oxford, Massachusetts. I want to know how it was like playing with LeBron James. Uh, playing with LeBron James uh, kind of helped me and helped you guys know who I was, you know. <laughs> it's like, if I didn't play with LeBron James, I think nobody would know who I, I am. But uh, besides that, I think just being able to, to see the growth of, of the hard work that he's put in to what you guys get to see now, him winning the championships, him uh, kind of being this traveling uh, I mean, just entertainment uh, cloud that has affected us in everybody's life. I mean, I, I had Michael Jordan when I grew up. You guys had an opportunity to have uh, LeBron James. So me, me being able to see that and see the work and calling my friend and my ex-teammate is, uh, is an honor. Mm -hmm. Thank you, bud. Now we've had the closer warming up. Here he comes. Nothing but fastballs in the ninth inning. Wearing his LeBron jersey. As the LeBron James jerseys <laughs> pops up, huh? I'm uh, Ryan from Wallingford, Connecticut. And who did you idolize as a kid and model your game after? Wow. I was like a blend in between Grant Hill and Akeem Olajuwon. And if you could put those guys, because I play the piano. I think I kind of look like Grant Hill. Uh, and I kind of played, and I was as tall as Akeem Olajuwon. So, those are like the two dudes I kind of wanted to be together, if that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great blend. Yeah, yeah. That yeah, is not yeah, a bad yeah. blend. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can you please give one last round of applause of appreciation to Mr. Drew Gooden? Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys.